Hello, I'm David Wallace, founder of PV Reporter and NPN Cancer Connection, a patient advocate living with polycythemia vera since 2009, and your host for today's Patients Are Asking program, which focuses on the latest research from the recent uh, American Society of Hematology Conference, or ASH. And we would like to thank our sponsors, Pharmacentia, Insight, Abvi, and Bristol-Myers Squibb for their support of today's program. Today, we are pleased to have Dr. V from MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. So uh, there were many exciting abstracts at ASH this year. So let's start with an early stage discovery that caught my eye. Um, can you shed some light on Insight's new CalR uh, targeted monoclonal antibody? What is it and how is it designed to work? David, thank you very much for having me on this program today. And you pick uh, the number one news from this meeting as it relates to MPN. This particular presentation was part of the plenary session. These are the best of the best. Uh, submitted abstract because they matter the most. And so, although we are talking here about the preclinical testing, the potential of these findings is really amazing. For a group of people that have monoproliferative neoplasm driven by a specific mutation, which is called color reticulin mutation, that's about a third of the patients with ET, essential thrombocytemia, and about a third of the patients with MF or myelofibrosis. Now, little introduction. So every single patient with MPN has hyperactive JAKSTAT pathway. JAKSTAT pathway is intracellular signaling pathway inside the cells, that cascade of protein that makes cells do something. So it's active all the time. My patients say it's, it's a highway. It's like active all the time, cells grow, inflammation happens. JAKSTAT highway, it's uh, caused by mutations in three different genes, gene in, called JAK2 gene or calreticulin gene or MPL gene. They are usually mutually exclusive mutations. And as I mentioned, a third of the patients with ET or MF have that gene that drives that JAK2 pathway. What happens when that gene makes a protein, the mutated protein is the culprit. In these patients, uh, in the bone marrows, the protein is excreted from the cells outside and binds to the surface of the cells kind of autocrine loop. It, it's excreted, binds on the surface of the cells, and that's how it uh, drives that growth. So it's outside the cells, it's visible to immune system. It's visible to us to make medications, antibodies. These are medications that uh, we call them antibodies for bodies, right? Antibodies, we have antibodies made that would be attaching itself specifically to the surface of the malignant cells that have on the surface malignant calreticulin protein. So there is a marker, marker on the surface of these cells, uh, and, and no other cell in the body has it, just these malignant cells have mutated calreticulin on the surface. So the potential of that antibody that was a subject of plenary session and its preclinical development is very high. We are talking about potential, and probably that's a key word, potential, to slowly over time, inhibits the signaling through this mutated protein and let these cells die off. So you would give a infusion perhaps of antibody to a patient and that would attach itself to the surface of the malignant cells, no other cell, and kill it slowly. And we would talk potentially about the elimination of the disease. We call this molecular response. And we, of course, you have fewer and fewer cells, then you have better quality of life, anemia results, and all the other signs and symptoms of the disease are not only controlled, but may potentially disappear. And so we talk about a huge potential for about a third of the patient, patients uh, with a good reason, as you can see, first time ever, that we are talking about the specific molecular marker that is utilized for a potential effective therapy and potential means possi possibility of eliminating disease. So uh, what were some of the highlights of this year's conference um, and what treatments can patients look forward to in the year ahead? Now, in myelofibrosis, we have the major need for new therapies because this is most aggressive of the three classic uh, 
uh, MPNs. Although we have a JAK inhibitors, we have ruxolitinib, then we have pacritinib and uh, fedratinib. Approved three different JAK inhibitors where we use them in different way to control the spleen and symptoms. Uh, and perhaps uh, pacritinib, which is approved for patients with very low platelets, can even improve anemia to some degree. We still don't have a therapy that work in a second line after JAK inhibitors or work for anemia uh, or therapies that would perhaps enhance what the JAK inhibitors do, more of the spleen and more of the symptom control. So among the drugs that would come up uh, probably as approved therapy soon, one stands out, and that's a drug called momelotinib. It is a, a JAK inhibitor too, but it does something else. That's the drug that improves the anemia, unlike any other. Uh, that is the primary goal of the phase three randomized study that uh, was reported for the first time last uh, summer and much, much more uh, was uh, presented to the public at this ash on, on that particular drug, momelotinib, which would be tackling the anemia in the second line setting once you lose response to ruxolitinib uh, and you don't know what else to do. Now, in combination with ruxolitinib in first line, you want to do the best you can from the get-go, right? There are combinations with different agents. One is navitoclax. Uh, navitoclax is the inhibitor of proteins that are important for cell death. You know, malignant cells in general live much longer, so you inhibit the problem with the longevity. People, cells die. Navitoclax in combination with ruxolitinib, as well as some other agents like uh, palabresive, which is a BAT inhibitor, inhibits BAT protein. You see, the mechanism actions are different. Or parsaclisib, PI3 kinase inhibitor, another different protein in the, in the cells. All of these drugs are being combined successfully so far with ruxolitinib, showing us that they can do more in terms of spleen control, symptom control, and possibly changing the bone marrow environment, changing the fibrosis, changing the genetic expression, changing the uh, cytokines, the protein that are circulating in the in a blood that make people feel bad, inflammatory proteins. A lot of different, uh, I would say, clinical and biological improvements with the combinations with the Navitoclax or Parsaclisib or Pelabresib. These are funny names, but these are real drugs that uh, have different mode of action than JAK inhibitors and can be combined to enhance what we do for the patients from the day one. In mentioning uh, fibrosis, um, I see, um, you know, patients are very concerned about their, uh, particularly with myelofibrosis, their fibrosis levels and uh, whatnot. Um, but I've also read reports where uh, the grade or level of fibrosis doesn't really equate to a better outcome or a longer life. Can you shed a little bit of light on that? I'm glad you brought this up because... With each new development uh, in the field, development in terms of potential new drug, new study, we not only look at the improvement in the anemia or spleen or symptoms, uh, we also look at these biological correlates, the fibrosis, the cytokines, the genes, expression of the genes, and we uh, kind of desire that uh, modifications in these biological parameters are really connected with the better overall outcome of the patients. For example, you would say, okay, uh, fibrosis is going down. That must mean that the bone marrow will make more red blood cells. Well, this study that you mentioned is very interesting. This was a study that looked uh, at several hundred of patients over a very long, of, for a long time, five or six years of follow-up. The patients that were subject to a study done way in the past where ruxolitinib was given or momelotinib, the one that I mentioned, and the difference between them is slight, not that much. Omelotinib can improve the anemia better, and uh, ruxolitinib or jacafi can do better on the symptoms, for example. They improve the spleen too. Um, no much difference. The ruxolitinib was a little better overall. But uh, these people who are now followed for this, all these years with the bone marrows uh, at the beginning and then six months. And as you say, easy to grasp, no connection between the change in the bone marrow fibrosis for better or for worse with improvement or worsening over red blood cell count or a spleen size or the symptoms or anything. 
that we consider clinically relevant, not even a connection with the overall survival, which is the bottom line, right? You would say fibrosis yeah. goes away, maybe anemia improves and splints decrease and you live longer. No, there was absolutely no connection. So a rise important question. Are we actually measuring the parameters that are of clinical relevance? We all assume that the fibrosis is important, but at least under the uh, therapy with these two agents, this is not a good marker for overall outcome of the patients in any possible way. So kind of disappointed, you want to say from one uh, look from one side, but you, yeah. you turn the other side and you say, maybe that's a good signal that gives us an incentive to look harder and find those parameters that really mean something. Fibrosis change does not appear to mean something. How do you determine from a clinician standpoint whether a patient's symptoms are related to their NPN, the medications they're taking, or perhaps uh, just normal signs of, of aging? Wonderful question, because I always tell my patients that you cannot blame all your symptoms on the blood condition. You are eligible, <laughs> kind of funny, right? You are eligible yeah. to get other medical problems and other uh, issues, right? So, um, you know, uh, what we are usually saying uh, when we say, talk about a, a, a disease-related symptoms, they are general. You know, um, you have a swollen knee uh, and you say, that must be because of my myelofibrosis. I would say highly, highly unlikely because it should be all over, right? You have disease all over. So all the, mm -hmm. all the joints should be swollen. Um, so, you know, night sweating, low grade fevers, itching, bone aches and pains, uh, weight loss. Uh, these are possibly related, but uh, there is no one way to prove it even, right? The one way would be uh, if it's disease related, you give patients something to improve. And let's say of, out of five problems, three improve, but the other two don't. Maybe something else is causing them. Or you ask about uh, is medication maybe causing side effects? The only way is to stop the medication, see whether it goes away, and then give a medication back and see whether the side effects come back. Uh, so trial and error in a way. Uh, but it's a good question because uh, people assume, oh, from now on, everything I experience in my life must be because of my blood condition. No, 